what do you think about like the, the ways in which, if we go from this world where we have this easy money to a world where everyone is on a Bitcoin standard and, and understands the concepts of the scarcity and the, uh, you know, the hesitance to take on unnecessary risk, how does that unfold? Does it have to come through some catastrophe where people blow up or, you know, like how, how do we get from point A to point B? For sure. There are a number of different ways we could get there, but I think it's it's sort of this combination of the necessity to lock interest rates as close to zero as possible because of this overwhelming debt load and the reality that if we don't do that, and even if we do do that, what that's going to cause is a very sustained, long depression where you have this long period of time not just decades, but several decades, where you know basically all productivity is used towards paying down this debt, right? That's reality one. Or reality two is uh, all of this productivity is implicitly defaulted on by governments around the world who have central banks who are just locking interest rates at zero and they're creating dollars and credit um, out of nowhere in order to in order to nominally pay down uh, essentially this debt. Um, and avoid having to increase the price of money and pay down this debt load. So it's sort of damned if you do, damned if you don't. And I think as a function of that, the people living in the society will become so distraught, so fed up through time that they naturally seek alternatives, right? Um, they, they no longer want to touch um, or even use the bad money anymore. They, they, they don't want anything to do with it. Um, and I think over time, people more and more will will take a look at Bitcoin as a savings technology. I think what, what we're doing with the Lightning Network right now, um, Bitcoin in my mind has yet to reach its store of value proposition. I think in order to reach its store of value proposition, it at the very least has to usurp the market cap of like a major equity indice um, or even you know half of gold or 75% of gold in order to sort of be considered a, a competitor, right? Um, you know, usurping silver's market cap, we already did that, I believe, uh, for, for a period of time when we went over $1 trillion. And I think for Bitcoin to become a store of value, that's what it needs to do for a sustained period of time. Um, you know, in this phase where there's, you know, mass distress, where nobody wants to engage in, in anything, um, in, in any sort of capital market activity because their currency is worthless, you know, they're, they're living in abject poverty and as this abject poverty spreads, I think Bitcoin inches closer to becoming a store of value because that's where people put their wealth. And then once Bitcoin usurps some of these larger monetary metals and then ultimately gold itself, I think that's the point at which Bitcoin's fully solidified as a store of value and it moves into a medium of exchange. And I think at that point, that is a point at which um, Basically, you know that we've talked about this proliferation of a Bitcoin capital market, and it's in its infancy right now. And this is the way that that I believe it will unfold. Um, I think at that point, when Bitcoin has already crossed the store of value threshold, taking over you know the, the market capitalization of all these monetary metals, that's the point at which you start to see Bitcoin become the primary um, primary you know daily driver for people's lives instead of the you know uh, whatever fiat currency. It's not going to topple. Bitcoin will not topple the United States dollar yet for for the foreseeable future, 10, 20, 30, 40 years. You know, the United States dollar is going to reign as the primary world reserve currency. But in some of these nations that are more financially fragile, where this dynamic of, you know, either inflationary or deflationary depression, um, the latter, of course, all the productivity goes to paying down this debt. In those countries like Sri Lanka with their, you know, their currency collapse, those will be the nations um, who take on Bitcoin as a reserve currency first. Um, and those will be the nations where the citizens begin transacting with Bitcoin first. And I think the transition is going to be, it's going to be slow and painful. It's not going to be bright and cheery. And I think the order in which it's going to go is, is one by one in these you know, fiat backed central bank uh, nations. Uh, that are the most financially fragile, that have the highest debt levels, that are you know the most uh, susceptible to collapse with these rate increases, um, or the other way, most susceptible coll to collapse with leaving the price of money at zero and allowing a hyperinflationary environment to ensue. You know you're seeing it in Sri Lanka. I think through time we see a lot more painful examples of this, and it starts there. I think you know. While in the United States, a lot of the development for Bitcoin and, and these Lightning Network tools uh, and these on-chain tools that are being created 
um, it's being created, they're, they're, you know, they're being created in the, the modernized world. I don't think Bitcoin is going to usurp the fiat currencies um, and the, the, the systems of the, the modernized Western world first. I think it's going to start in uh, you know, much more impoverished nations, financially fragile nations, and then through time it will work its way uh, towards the world's superpowers. But essentially Bitcoin, um, you know, as the underlying base layer money, um, it, it starts sort of with the weakest of links and then, and then progresses on.